Hello guys, so we are going to discuss today unit number 20, okay? So please remember, uh, there are two chapters, two units are there, study unit number 19 plus study unit number 20. So these two chapters are called technology and analytics section. Uh, and in your CM exam, it is your 15% of your exam. So unit 19, we have already studied in which we talked about information system and related things. And we also discussed about the data governance. So today we have a unit number 20, which is system development and data analytics. In unit number 20, we have two main topics. 20.1 is about technology enabled finance transformation. And 20.2, which is second topic is about analytics and big data. So we are going to start with the first one, first topic. So here we go. So guys, very first thing which we are going to understand here, that is called system development life cycle. So SDLC is the short form for system development life cycle. So guys, you need to understand what does mean by system. System means to say guys, for example, uh, it could be a hardware software combination, right? Or for example, maybe you are going to acquire an ERP system. Okay, so that is also your system. And obviously that ERP you will install somewhere in the hardware, right? So what is system development life cycle? So we are going to discuss. So under like whenever you are developing any system, so it will follow, you will follow five steps. So then after five steps, these are just general overview. I will explain components and phases of the system development life cycle. If you, in your exam, if they're asking you only what is system development life cycle, so then you will write these five steps, understood? But if they are asking you component and phases, then there are seven components and phases are there that you will write, understood? So here we go. So system development life cycle. For example, guys, so very first step under system development, like whenever you are acquiring new system and you want to install that system, so what is the first stage? First stage is called system strategy. It's quite easy. System strategy means to say what? So simply under this step, so you have to understand the organizational needs, organizational needs. Like simply you have to answer uh, some couple of questions. Like for example, you have to think about first your existing or current system, whatever you are using. So you have to think what is the current system, okay? And what are the needs which are unmet by current system? Current system can help you in your growth phase. I mean to say maybe when company will grow, uh, is this system will be suitable at that time or not, right? So you have to simply answer a few couple of questions while you are understanding the organizational needs. Like for example, what examples I quoted? I said, for example, you have to check is your current system sufficient to support your projected growth? Uh, all the current, uh, you know, whatever requirements are there, it is met by the current system or not? If not, what are the unmet needs by the current system? So based on that unmet needs, which kind of new system, okay, can help you to fulfill those needs? So this is called what system strategy. So keyword is here what? So simply you have to understand the organizational needs. That is called system strategy. Second is what? So second step under system development life cycle is that is called project initiation. Project initiation is what? Obviously it is the process by which system proposals are assessed. So here I'm going to explain this word. This word will be explained again later on after a few couple of minutes. System proposal means a simply guys feasibility report. Because whenever you acquire new system before the acquisition, there is some paperwork. Okay, that is called feasibility report. In feasibility report, you will again answer this question. For example, why you are going to acquire the new system? Okay, what are the needs which are unmet by the current system? Understood? How much cost it will take to implement the new system or to acquire the new system? How much time it, it requires to implement? How, which kind of resources, other resources like maybe human people, etc. you need to, you know, uh, implement the system. So that is called feasibility report. Understood in, as I told you, under feasibility report, just simply you will answer a couple of questions in a document shape. Like for example, if this is the document, so you will write here, what are the needs 
uh, which are unmet by the current system what are the needs uh, you know due to that you are looking for the new system what benefits new system will offer you how much it will cost you how much time it will take to implement which kind of support from management you need so you will prepare these documents and this is called feasibility report okay so this feasibility report mostly we will submit to the top management i'm not using that word top management means a steering committee that i'll explain after a few couple of minutes okay so this feasibility report once you will submit to the steering steering committee what is steering committee actually in steering committee you might have a three four five members from the senior management understood so you will send this proposal to the senior management to the steering committee because steering committee is designed specially for it relevant issue like for example if you want to acquire new hardware or new software or even if you want to upgrade or make certain changes in the hardware or the softwares so you will always seek a permission from the steering committee right so once this feasibility report will be prepared this feasibility report will be sent to the steering committee and then they will accept or reject your proposal if they reject matter is over here if they will accept then you will move to the further stage so what is the third step that is called in house development in house development means obviously guys if you want a unique information system right unique system so obviously then it is better you should develop the system in house you should hire some programmers some system analysts or some system designers okay they can work together understood to you know develop a system for your unique need so that is called in-house development in-house means obviously in within your company you are going to develop your system okay so then you have another four step that is called commercial packages obviously guys for example i i have started new business and I want some accounting software and my business is re retail relevant. Let's assume my business is retail business. So now maybe my needs are not unique. My needs are common. I need a software which can fulfill my common needs, right or wrong. And I can buy the ready-made software from the market. For example, I can buy QuickBook, Tally, Peachtree, these kind of softwares. So that is that is called commercial packages. So commercial packages are generally chosen for common needs rather than developing a new system from scratch like in commercial packages in simple words you are going to buy ready-made package ready-made software for your needs that is called commercial package then we have a fifth stage that is called maintenance and support guys <coughs> what does mean by maintenance and support if you will look at it it's written maintenance supports involves ensuring the system accommodates changing user needs. So let me explain with the help of example. Maybe with the passage of time, uh, maybe maybe after one year, you, you may think that you need to add these kind of options in your software or you want to delete these options because it is not suitable for your business. Like simply you, have, you want to upgrade your system. So that is called maintenance and support. So this is the fifth step under system development life cycle, which is called maintenance and sports and here you will ensure that your system accommodates changing user needs because obviously users might have different requirements okay which which might not be available currently in your system so you may ask some, some people to bring those changes or to make those changes in your system that is called maintenance and support so these are overall five steps of system development life cycle so now guys here let me explain so if they will ask you in your exam most of the time, if maybe they can ask you in the essay question as well, or maybe in the uh, MCQs as well. So if they will ask you to talk about phases and component steps, okay, of traditional system development life cycle. Okay, like if they are asking about phases and component steps, so then you will write five, seven steps, not five. If they're asking overall system development life cycle, what it is, then you will write five steps. But if they are asking phases and components, then you will write seven steps. So what seven steps are there? So almost these seven steps includes those five steps also. So that I'll explain, don't worry. So step number one, it's just a graphical picture in front of you. Then we'll start studying one by one. So the first step is called initiation, feasibility, and planning. This is the first step. I'm just reading headings over. So then I'll explain. 
Step number two is called requirement analysis and definition. What is the step number one? Initiation, feasibility, and planning. Step number two is what? Requirement analysis and definition. And step number three is what? System conceptual design. Here you are going to design something that I'll explain. Step number four is what? Building and develop. Building and development. So obviously you're going to write that software, etc. Step number five is what? Testing and quality control. Obviously after development, you are going to test it. So there we will discuss various methods and level of testing. Then we have here user acceptance, installation and implementation. Obviously once system is developed, and it is tested. So then you will show it to the user who, who requested that development, right or wrong. He will accept and then you will install and implement that we'll see how to implement. And then we have a last seven stage that is called operations and maintenance, okay? So these are seven phases and components of system development life cycle. So here we go, guys. So starting with the first phase, as I told you, a lot of information will be repeated as I have explained in the first five steps of system development life cycle. So first phase is called initiation, feasibility and planning. So guys, it is very simple. So here you have to remember a few couple of words in this first stage. First of all here, you have to answer this question. Is there any need for a new system? Okay, in the first stage, you have to check, is there any need? If answer is yes, how answer is yes, maybe your old system is not supportive. Maybe your old system is not fulfilling all the requirements. So it means there could be a need, right? So then after that, guys, you have to think, you have to determine whether it is feasible to create a solution. I mean to say if there is a need of new system. So then you have to think about, so is it feasible to acquire a new system and you will formulate a plan. So I would simply say, under this first stage, once needs are identified and you have decided there are needs, obviously immediately, so based on your needs, you should prepare a feasibility report. Okay, so overall feasibility report, they explained in the uh, second, but in first stage, you should prepare feasibility report. Understood? And after that, once feasibility report is ready, as I told you, in feasibility report, you will answer a couple of questions. Like for example, uh, what are the needs which are unmet by the current system? What benefits new system will offer you? Right? How much time it will take? How much cost it will uh, it it requires to implement? Right? So which support you need from the top management? Okay. So all these things you will include under the feasibility report. And now the first step is done. Once first step is done, now you will move to the second step that is called requirement analysis and definition. As I told you guys, whatever. Feasibility report you have prepared in the first phase. Now that is called formal proposal. Okay, it's written formal proposal because that feasibility report means a formal proposal. Now the a formal proposal for the new system is submitted to the IT steering committee. This is what I was saying. So steering committee means it's a group of people, maybe four or five people from the senior management. So whenever you want to make any changes, even in hardware and software, Okay, IT relevant issues. So you have to contact with the steering committee through your proposal. So they will accept or they will reject. If they will accept, you will move to the onward stage. Okay, this is what it's written. They are saying formal proposal of the new system is submitted to the IT steering committee. And I told you already, so formal proposal means a feasibility report. And in feasibility report, so almost you answer these questions I explained earlier also. So now I'm explaining again. So in the formal proposal, which you are submitting to the steering committee, that proposal, what it will include? It will include what technology the new system will require, like which kind of software you are looking for, what economic resources, like maybe cash, people, et cetera, or maybe developers, programmers, what economic resources must be committed to the new system, okay? Then what is the next? How the new system will affect the current operation or simple words, what benefits new system will offer you. So this feasibility report, you have submitted to home, you have submitted to the steering committee, right? Now the proposal is with the steering committee and steering committee gives its go ahead for the project. So it's not compulsory. They will always say, okay, go ahead. No, they may reject also. 
But we assume, for example, if they have accepted it, if they have accepted our proposal, now we will move to the third stage. But if they have rejected, so matter is over here. So if they have accepted our proposal, so now the third stage will come. That is called system conceptual design. Understood? This is the third phase, which is called system conceptual design. So what it is, let me explain here. Guys, system conceptual design mean to say simply, there are two types of designs here. Here you are going to conceptualize the system. Okay, maybe on the paper. Okay, so there are two types of design you can uh, create here. One is called logical design. Please remember when you will define system conceptual design stage. So you have to explain these two words. You have to explain about logical design. You have to explain about physical design. Understood? And the third point you have to explain who will heavily participate in this process. Understood? That is the third one which is written here. So obviously system analyst will participate. But let me help you. So what is system conceptual design? And under system conceptual design, what is the logical design? Guys, I will give you simple example. So logical design means say you are going to map. Like you are going to create a map. Okay. Like how the data will flow and where data will be stored in the new system. So let us let me explain this uh, 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 concept with the example. For example, guys, let us assume you are going to logically design the system for a university. Let us assume. Okay, so relevant example I am giving you, you are also student. For example, what is this is logical design means you are doing paperwork. You are preparing some diagrams. Okay, which, which could be data flow diagram, which could be system interface, interface, you know, how system will look like. Okay, structured flow charts are commonly used in this step. So how you will create these diagrams or maps. So I'm just giving you rough idea. Okay, so by the way, this is design stage, paperwork. For example, take the example from university, let's new. We will design on a paper. Like, for example, if student will come for admission with whom he will meet, maybe he will meet with the student counselor or maybe admission officer whoever okay uh, he is so he will meet him so the student counselor or the admission officer he will check the educational background of the students by looking at their educational documents okay once student uh, admission officer he satisfied that this student is for example uh, let's assume eligible to get admission in this program so he will do the registration of the student and he will obviously uh, uh, let us upload all the scanned copy of educational documents. So this is the first stage. Understood? After that one student is registered in the system. So for example, this information okay, is stored and now student will go to the finance department, for example. Now finance manager or finance people, they will open the software and they, then they will see this student is registered in how many courses? For example, if you have a university level student, maybe you are registered in four courses at a time or maybe five courses at a time. So he will check in which courses he is registered. Okay, and according to that, he will calculate the fee. What is the fee of the student? Please make sure we are thinking that the finance people will get this information from the software, which is entered by admission officer initially. Now, they will calculate the fee and they will collect the fee and then maybe in the system they will update like how much fee is paid. Maybe this student is fully paid. Then this information is updated in the system. Now maybe the student will go to the, for example, bookshop or to the library from where he can collect his book. Now again, the librarian or the, or the bookshop, bookshopper, maybe he will uh, open again the system and he will see this student is registered in these subjects and he will issue the books to the students according to your registration. Now, maybe obviously once books are issued, again, he will update in the system that these books are issued. So this is what we want, for example. Understood? This is what we want. Like this system should be like that. So this thing, we are all deciding on paper. Like this is how it should look. This person will enter information. This person can access the information. Then next person will enter the information. These people can access the information. So this is called logical design. Okay, so you can see it's a data flow diagram also, like how data will flow. System interface diagram, like how system will look. 
which tab should be on the top, okay, are structured flow charts. So they are commonly used in the steps. So this is what is called, uh, you know, logical design. Understood? Please make sure here. So when you are designing the system, for example, here this one point is written, some data elements may already be stored in the existing database. Maybe if that student is already existing students, so maybe he has some information already in the software. So please remember good logical design. Ensure that they are not duplicated, like the data should not be duplicated. Understood? So now this is what is logical design. Now we have here physical design. Physical design is what? That's under physical design. So here, please first let's understand Then I'll give you example. Under physical design, physical design involves planning the specific interactions of the new program, code and data elements with the hardware platform existing or planned for purchases. Simply physical design means say, here you are trying to decide this soft software will be installed in these hardwares. Maybe for example, this software, we need a separate server. So here that is why they are saying specific interactions. Interactions between what? Data elements with the hardware. So simply here under physical design, so you are deciding like which kind of devices you need, which kind of software you need, uh, and when it will be installed, where it will be installed. So this information, okay, you will uh, draw, but again, it is on a piece of paper. Because it's a conceptual design. After that, guys, the third thing here you have to remember, in this system conceptual design stage, system analysts, because they will ask this question, system analysts are heavily involved in these two steps. System analyst is one specific job is there. Uh, you know, in IT department, so they always analyze the system, trying to find out the weaknesses, etc. So they will heavily involved in this two steps. So this is the third stage. I hope so it is clear. Now, guys, we are going to discuss about the fourth phase and components that is called building and development. One system is obviously designed, right? Uh, on the paper, now it is a time uh, that that system should be written, right? So here, what you will do? So in building and development stage, actual program, actual program code, means say you are going to develop a software now. Actual program code, you know, when you develop a software, you need to do coding. So actual program code and database structure that will be used in the new system are written. Like here, programmers, they will start writing the code as per the design. Okay, that is called building and development. Please remember, obviously, if the programmers, they need specific hardware. So the hardware will be acquired and physical infrastructure is assembled and the actual programs are written, actual code are written. So this is what is called building and development. Obviously, they will develop a software, then they will acquire a hardware. And obviously, after that, once this is done, so now the fifth stage, fifth phase will come that is called testing and quality control. It is a little bit long stage. And here it is, uh, it can be only tested separately, also individually as well in your exam question. So guys, obviously, testing and quality control, what it means. Testing, I'm explaining. Main word is testing here. Obviously, guys, testing you can perform during system development also. Like when you are writing the programs, obviously you should test it during the development stage as well. The reason, what is the point why we are testing during the development? Because we want to find errors. If there are any errors or if there are any other defects are there, okay, so you should test during the development also. Now, question is why to test? First answer I gave you, just to find out errors and defects during the development phase. Second, why to test? Second phase is what? We have to check because we are testing to see whether this system meets the requirement. Obviously, you know, the needs for which this system was written. So this system is fulfilling those requirements or not. Second, you have to check the system responds correctly to all kind of inputs. Now, whatever data you are entering so the system is processing the data accurately then you will you also want to check the system performs its function within acceptable time it is not like that 
So you, you are expecting that this system should complete this task within three minutes, but system is taking 30 minutes. So testing will also tell you about the time frame also that the system is performing its function within acceptable time. And testing will also help you to see whether the system achieves the general results its stakeholders desire. Obviously, the purpose for which system was developed. So system is fulfilling that purpose or not. So this is the mainly overall objective of testing. Why to test? These are the objective of testing. But the point is that how many testing methods are there? If they will ask you guys testing methods, by the way, these are more about software language, but you are uh, going to be accountant. So you are not going to be a developer. So that is why overall main theme you need. Okay, so how to test? So there are overall five testing methods are there. Guys, there are two questions. If they will ask you testing methods, then you will write these five methods. But if they will ask you level of testing, so level of testing, I'll explain after some time. So these are testing methods. Understood? So there are five methods are available to test in your system. Okay, so which is in our exam. So one, the first method is called static testing. First is called what? Static testing. What is static testing? Yes, please remember, stat, under static testing, you are going to examine. What you are going to examine? Guys, you are going to examine only paperwork. Under static testing, you are not going to execute the program. Okay, by giving some inputs to the program. No. So there is no execution to the program here. You are not going to execute any program. Just you are going to examine what? You are going to examine the program's code. That coding is correct. And it's associated documentation. Maybe the flow charts you will read. For logical design, physical design. Understood? So that you will just read it through reviews. Reviews means obviously you are going to review those documents walkthroughs or it's also called inspection but please remember under static testing we do not okay execute the program we do not execute the program this is what is called static testing it means what are the keywords under static testing it is the examination of program codes and associated documents without the execution of program this is called what static testing understood then guys, we have here dynamic testing. Please remember in your books, only two, two lines are written. By the way, for your exam, only those two lines are enough if you will write it properly. Otherwise, I'll, I'm explaining here. So second method of testing is called what? Dynamic testing. Please remember here, under dynamic testing, first thing you should remember, here you are going to execute the program code. Like you are going to, for example, you have... Uh, designed for example accountant receivables or receivables tab okay now you want to check this receivable tab is working properly in your accounting software or not so first thing under dynamic testing you are going to run this program code okay second thing is what with a given set of test cases test cases means say simply you will give some entry to the system for example you made a credit sales you want to record now debit receivables credit sales you will record in the system and you want to see system is producing the results as per your expectation or not this is called dynamic testing so keywords is what two keywords are there here you will execute the program with a given set of test cases test cases means that you are going to give some input to the system and then you are going to check the output output produced by the system you will see this output is as per your expectation or not. That is called what dynamic testing. Understood? Then guys, we have other types of testing as well. So here guys, we have, and don't confuse it, just write whatever I'm explaining here and not more than that. So now here we have a white box testing. Again guys, it is also testing, like a dynamic testing. Okay, so but what is the difference here? Under dynamic testing, you are just checking uh, with the help of, you know, test data that your program code is working properly or not. Okay, under white box testing, what you will do? Again, here you are going to test internal structure. Again, are the working of the program like a dynamic testing as opposed to the functionality exposed to the end user point of view. Like simply, you will think like, like you are end users 
and as an user, if you will enter data, what you will get it. Okay, so that is white box testing. But if you want to refine it in proper wording, you should write these things under white box testing. Okay, what you will do? So the tester, white box testing that provides the tester, like when you test the software. So what software or which kind of information you are looking for? Uh, looking from the white box testing. So the tester with complete knowledge of the application being tested. Okay, obviously you have complete knowledge first, understood for that application. And you will check including access to source code. You have knowledge of the source code also and the design documents. Simply again, I'm, I'm reading here, explaining here white box testing is a form of application testing. Under white, white box testing provides a tester with complete knowledge of application being tested. It will also provide you access to the source code and the design documents. This in depth visibility makes it possible for the white box testing to identify issues that are invisible to gray box testing and black box testing. In simple words, guys, here you have a uh, complete uh, knowledge information about okay the source code and design documents understood and just what you are trying to see from end user point of view maybe you are trying to see like it is functioning properly or not that is called white box testing understood now guys here we have here now black box testing again what are the keywords please remember here black under black box testing so this is the keyword you should remember here that person who is going to test the system. He has no programming knowledge. What I said? He has no knowledge of system internals. Okay. He has no knowledge. Like he don't know if, for example, system is not functioning properly under black box I'm explaining now. For example, I'm the tester. Now I process some transactions or maybe I'm testing specific area. Understood, but I do not have any information about the programming are about the internal structure of the system. But what I'm trying to see, as a tester, I'm trying to see, I'm trying to evaluate the functionality, the system is functioning properly, the security of the data, the performance of the system. Okay, so these things I'm trying to see. That is called what black box testing. Now, in black box testing, you have to highlight this word. So here, first of all, the person who is going to test, he has no knowledge of system internals, but he, what overall he is checking, he is trying to see the functionality, security, and performance of the system. That is called black box testing. Once you will read it one more time as explained, obviously it will become, it will fit in your mind. Understood? Now again, guys, under gray box testing, we have gray box testing also. Please remember here the tester, the person, the person who is going to Test the system. First of all, he will have a knowledge. He will have a knowledge of the program's internal data structures and algorithms, whatever they have used in designing the system. Understood? And for example, if system is not working functionally or properly, so the, under the gray box testing, the tester can analyze which set of codes are not working. So in simple words, gray box testing is more detailed. If you will combine black box testing, and white box testing. Black box under white box, you know, I said. So from end user point of view, you are testing. Okay. Under black box testing, what I said, I said here you don't have information. You don't have a knowledge about source code, etc. But you are testing the system. You want to see functionality, security, and performance of the system. If you will combine both black box and the white box testing, if you will combine both, both testing, it is actually called gray box testing. So it means gray box testing is more detailed. Understood? So you have to just remember this equation. Just remember what is black box and what is white box. If you will combine these two, it will become a gray box test. Understood? I hope so it is clear. Now guys, we are going to discuss here four levels of testing. Please remember it's a fifth stage still testing and quality control. Okay, in testing, first I explained what is the objective of testing. I explained it there. Then I told you how many methods of testing are there. Now I'm going to explain four levels of test, like at which level you test it. Okay, 
What is the depth of testing in simple words? The first level is what? Now please try to concentrate here. So first level of testing is called unit testing. I can just give you a simple example. For example, guys, you are writing accounting programs, okay? If accounting programs. You know, in under accounting software, you have a different tab. You might have a tabs for assets. Maybe you have a tabs for liabilities. Let's assume you have a tabs for, for example, income, tabs for expenses, cap, tab for equity, let's assume. Okay. Under unit testing, what you are checking? For example, like guys, I'm just giving example. So let's assume you have recorded depreciation expense in the system. What is the entry? Dabber depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation, right? This is the entry normally. Depreciation is your expense, but accumulated depreciation is the contra account to the asset because accumulated depreciation we deduct from the asset in the balance sheet, right? It's a contra account. Now unit testing is what? Unit testing, please, first one you have to remember here, you are just checking the workability or functionality of a specific section of code. For example, maybe you are just trying to see asset tab is working okay or liability tab is working okay. Okay, just you are checking specific section of the code only. Specific section. Understood? Specific section, that is called unit testing. So you're not going to check the whole software. No, you are going to check a specific section of the software. That is called unit testing. Then we have here integration testing. Integration testing is what? For example, guys, receivable account is your asset account. Sale account is your revenue account, right? Because we record, when we make credit sale, we record debit receivables, credit sales. So receivable asset is different tab. Income revenue is different tab. Now, what is integration testing? Integration testing means say here you are going to integrate, like here, integration testing works to expose defects in the interface and interaction between integrated components or modules. Simply words, for example, asset is one module, income is another module. So you are just going to integrate, you are seeing when you record receivables and sales, the receivable is recorded in asset, our receivable is updated in asset section and sales is updated in income section. So you are checking integration of different modules here. That is called what? Integration testing. Understood? For example, inventory. Inventory can be linked with the sales also. Like when you made any sales, obviously. So you also, system should also record the inventory also, which inventory is moved or converted to the sales. So you are just trying to interconnect. Inventory again is your asset and sale is your income account. You are just trying to see when you hit the inventory, it is hitting the income or also or not, or cost of goods sold also or not, right? So this is what is called integration testing. Keyword here, what? Interactions, interaction testing works to expose defects in interface and interaction between components and modules. Then we have here, guys, system testing. What is the difference under unit testing? Under unit testing, you are checking one specific section. Under integration testing, you are checking more than one sections at a time if they are interlinked. Then we have a system testing. System testing is what? It is also called end-to-end -end testing. So what it means? Here, test a completely integrated system. Completely integrated system. And so obviously, if you have a software, obviously that software you need to you will maybe install temporarily in the hardware also because it will become now system. So end-to-end -end testing, test completely integrated system to verify that system meets its requirement. Or in simple words here, you are checking the whole system that it fulfills the requirements or not. That is called system testing. Then guys, what it is, end-to-end -end testing would say you are checking completely integrated system. The complete system you are checking here. Then guys, you have acceptance testing. Obviously, acceptance testing once system is completed, software is completed, right or wrong. Maybe you will install this software uh, and maybe within your company, maybe you will install this software in certain hardware and then you will see it is functioning or not. This acceptance testing, first of all, guys, because if you are a programmer, okay? So first, as a programmer, you will see, okay, this, Software, once it is installed in the hardware, 
it is functioning properly or not. If yes, it is functioning properly. So it and it's fulfilling the need of organization. It means this is ready for release now. Ready for release home to home. Obviously, to those people who requested the upgradation or who requested the software. Once as a programmer, you are satisfied. Now you will move to the sixth stage that is called acceptance, installation and implementation. Here what you will do, obviously the system which as a programmer, for example, you have tested it. Now you will show this system to the end user. End user means simply to or to those people who requested the change, who requested the upgradation. So you will show to them once, once they are satisfied, those people, for example, maybe I was the one who requested you, you are the programmer to write this application and you have done that and you have checked by yourself, that is also acceptance. But now you are bringing to me and you are asking Kasim, check it, it is functioning or not. Now, what I will see as a user acceptance testing is the final step before placing the system in live operations. So first, obviously you will show it to me. So IT must demonstrate like you, you are the programmers. You must demonstrate to the user. You have to demonstrate to me who submitted the original request because I was the one who submitted the original request that the system performs the desired function. If I will be satisfied, I would say, yes, I am acknowledging that you have done my work and I will give you formal acceptance maybe through the paper that I am uh, all the necessary changes has been made and I am ready to, and I'm accepting this software now or this system now. And now what you will do, obviously once you will show to me to bring it to the live operation, obviously you have to implement now. We have to maybe install now in my hardware maybe. Understood? So now implementation strategy. So guys, one system is hardware. Obviously it is installed now. So now guys, once it is installed, now we have here four strategies which we will use to implement. So these are the implement strategies. Because obviously after installation, you will show it to me. Okay, and once it is accepted, now once I have accepted it, so now it means I want to implement in my operations. So that is called implementation. So now guys, there are four strategies for implementation. If they will ask you, what are the four strategies for implementation of system? So then you will write these four strategies. Number one, guys, the first strategy to implement the system. For example, let's assume so far to understand. For example, we are a bank and we have a multiple branches and we got a new system. That, that system we want to implement now in our branches. So first strategy is called what? That is called parallel implementation. Okay, parallel implementation. What it means? Parallel means say, as a bank. Now think, I'm the bank. Okay, I got a system. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to implement parallel. I'm going to use my old system also and my new system, new system which I got from you. Old maybe which I have already old. Okay, with me. So old I will also use, new I will also use. Okay, both will be run at full capacity for a given period. Maybe for three months, four months. You know, I will run my old system also. I will run my new system also. Parallel I will run. Understood? Why? Because the reason is that maybe my new system might have some bugs, some defects. Right or wrong, at least my data will be stored in the old system. Right or wrong, so that is why I, for, uh, to be on the safe side, I am running both systems uh, together. Once I will be satisfied that my new system is doing good, then maybe I will stop using the old system that is called what? Parallel operation. So keyword here is what? Keyword is you are going to use your old and new system together. Old and new system together. Understood for a given period of time. But it is guys obviously most expensive and time consuming. They will ask you this question, which is the most expensive strategy obviously this parallel because you are running two system at a time. Understood it's most expensive strategy. Then, Second strategy for implementation is called direct changeover. Direct changeover. It is also called direct cutover. It's called direct cutover conversion or direct changeover conversion. First one was parallel conversion. Now we have a direct changeover 
a direct cut over conversion. So here what I will do, simply old system I will stop using and I will start using the new one. Understood? So this is what they are saying. The old system is shut down and the new system takes over processing at once. Like you are going to implement the whole new system at once. You are going to start and you are going to stop the usage of old system. That is called direct change over. And guys, obviously, this is the most riskiest. If they will ask you which is the most riskiest, you would say direct change over. The reason is that there is least expensive. This is less expensive, less expensive and less time consuming also. But it is also more riskiest because the new system cannot be reverted to the original in case if there is any problem. Understood? So this is the most dangerous strategy. So keyword is riskiest also is the keyword here. Then we have a third uh, implementation method that is called pilot conversion. Pilot conversion is what guys? So please remember as I give you example, pilot conversion I'm telling you. As an example, as I gave you, for example, I am a bank. I have a various branches. Please remember, let's assume this is my branch A, branch B, branch C, branch D. So I'm going to implement, here look at the word what I'm saying. I'm going to implement full system, but in one branch at a time. But in one branch, full system I'm applying, but in one branch. Once I will be satisfied, oh, this is successful. Then I will implement another branch, but full system. Again, if that is also successful, then I will implement in third branch, but again, full system. Then, and so on in all branches. So guys here, what is the plus point? That is called pilot conversion. So under pilot conversion, one branch and maybe one department and maybe one division at a time is fully converted to the new system. As I told you, two keywords. So you are applying your full system, but in one branch here. Understood? So what is the, you know, uh, advantage of this pilot conversion. Obviously, if you will implement in one branch first and if you face some problems in the, in the implementation of the first branch, so those problems can be maybe uh, overcome in the implementation of second branch. But what these are the drawbacks? Obviously, the one disadvantage of this strategy is extension of the conversion time. Obviously, you need more time to implement the system throughout all the branches, right? So it will extend your time of conversion. So this is what pilot conversion. Then we have a fourth conversion that is called phased. Right? I, I told you parallel conversion, direct changeover or direct cutover conversion, then pilot conversion and the fourth is phased conversion. So please remember here guys, please under phased conversion, for example, I want to implement accounting software. Accounting software. Okay, please. Under Pilot, I said you are going to apply full system in one branch, but under phased conversion, you are not going to apply full system. No, not full system, not. Then what? If it is accounting software, maybe I'm going to first apply accounting receivable tabs. Then maybe I will apply accounting payable tabs. If this is also successful, maybe then I will apply other assets module, fixed asset module. If that is successful, maybe then I'll apply liability tab and maybe then I'll apply inventory tab. So, so on gradually I will move. Okay, that is called what? Phased conversion. So what is the keywords here for the phased conversion? The keyword is the phased conversion is possible under this strategy. One function of the new system as I told you account receivables or accounts payables or the cash maybe. So one function of the new system at a time is placed in the operation. Understood? So what is the advantage of this? The advantage of this strategy is that users are able to learn one part of the system at a time. Understood? Because gradually you will learn also. So this is what is called the phased conversion. And obviously, guys, when you implement the system, so test training and documentation is also very critical. The reason is that when the system is going to be implemented, so you have to give some, you know, guidance, maybe in the hard copy or in the online, how to use the system, blah, blah, blah. Maybe sometime training is also provided to the people or maybe sometime you're also providing uh, operational manuals for the users also like as you're buying an electronic device so you got the user manuals right so same way these are called documentation that is also critical sometime we need to provide trainings to the staff how to use the new system or at least guidance documentation 
Now, guys, that is the last stage I'm going to tell you. That is called operation and maintenance. Okay, operations and maintenance. So, operation and maintenance this is the seventh stage, seventh phase. Under operation and maintenance, what? After a system becomes operational, it should be monitored. Okay, if it is implemented and it is now you are using it, so now you should monitor to ensure ongoing performance and continuous improvement. Continuous improvement means maybe with the passage of time, if you want to add certain options, you have you can do it. If you want to delete certain option, you can do it. And sometimes you also do systems follow up or post audit. Also, you do just to evaluate or just to review the efficiency of the system and effectiveness of the system. Mostly we do this post audit evaluation maybe after one year of the implementation. Okay, you want to see like the purpose for which it was acquired that is fulfilling right or wrong. It's working effectively. Okay, and it is efficient also, right? So, and if if you are want to improve it, so you can make certain changes that is called operation and maintenance. I hope so guys, it is clear. Is that clear guys?